Well, hello. Welcome to Jewel Says. I'm Julie. If you have anything you'd like to ask or share with me, email me at jewelsays at gmail.com. I got an email recently asking if I'd be interested in being in a small budget commercial. I get those once in a while. Sometimes I do them. This was from someone named Fred, which is my grandson's name, which means whenever I hear that name, my heart just knots up with love. (laughs) An excerpt from the email is, We find you are an excellent fit for one of the roles. The character is an elderly couple who dances slowly in the kitchen and enjoys food together. (laughs) Well, Fred, I'm not available anyway, as it happens, but I kind of bristled at elderly. Look, I'm very transparent about my age. I'm 62. But when I hear the word elderly, I just, I envision a level of feebleness that certainly does not apply to me. Technically, It's true, I guess. I am elderly. I looked up the definition. According to Merriam-Webster, 1A, rather old. Yeah, I guess that applies. Especially being past middle age. Well, that definitely applies. B, old-fashioned. Well, maybe I am old-fashioned in certain ways. 2, of relating to or characteristic of later life or elderly persons. Synonyms. Aged, ancient, geriatric, old, older, I'm okay with those, over the hill, senescent, which is defined as the growth phase in a plant or plant part, such as a leaf, from full maturity to death. So yeah, I'm on the fast track to death, I guess. It is true, technically. So I suppose Fred's not wrong, but here's a helpful hint for people. Don't fucking refer to an energetic, sharp, glowingly healthy person as elderly. Some of us find that term offensive. Am I the only one who feels this way? Maybe I'm being an overly sensitive asshole. I've also seen so many student casting requests refer to people over 40 as elderly. So you know what? Why don't we all just agree to piss off with that word? The older you get, the older elderly looks. Let me assure you. I've talked about my neighborhood before, and I love my neighborhood. We've had our share of unusual characters roaming about, Some of them can be a bit frightening at times, but only very occasionally. And because the area is so busy with foot traffic and bustling small businesses, I do feel quite safe. I I actually feel as though Toronto isn't a teeming metropolis. It feels, to me anyway, more like a collection of small towns all smashed together in tight living quarters with skinny little houses. Our lot's only 17 and a half feet wide. When people come from a small town, they're like, oh my God, there's nowhere to move. Yeah, you're right. And just like a small town, people really help each other out and they get to know their neighbors. And because Abe did most of our renovations himself, he got to know a lot more people in the area than I did. It's so funny to me to see grown men hang around a construction or renovation site just watching, chatting. They're just so interested in what's going on, sometimes pitching in to help. He got a lot of offers from people to help them with their renovations, but that's not his job, so he had to decline. I was still working in Sarnia during the week that first year and a half, But I remember Abe telling me over the phone that he was one of the gang one day. He's like, well, I met some neighborhood guys who can help with the reno. That's great. A lot of these guys hung around a gritty little local bicycle shop. New Year's Eve that first year, 2008, I arrived home from Sarnia to hang out with some of them in the back room of the bike shop. It was a gently snowing night, pitch black, and off we went as soon as I got the car parked. Not the most glamorous party. It was a dirty garage party in folding chairs, and it was cold. 
We all huddled around a small wood stove and had a few drinks. Not exactly my idea of a great time, but these were the guys who were interested in helping out with some of the labor, so fine, Abe's new friends. There was one very young woman, a girl, really, with one of the guys. It turned out that she had dropped out of high school. She hated her parents. They were too controlling. I tried to just listen for the most part because I know teens do not enjoy a lecture, but of course I worried about her. After a while, I started asking her a few questions, such as, Have you thought about your next move? Are you happy? Do you really feel safe in this situation? I told her that I was sure her parents loved her, and even though they were driving her crazy, they probably were just worried about her choices and wanted what was best for her, probably. She at least agreed with that. I think most of us parents really aren't horrible people. Even if we're terrible, we are doing our best, and we do usually want what's best for our children. But this little gal had dropped out of school. She didn't have a job. I asked her what kind of job she thought she might like. Oh, she had worked for a while at a lingerie store, she told me, modeling in the window. Apparently, there was a lingerie store on Queen Street that featured live models in their window. So she liked being a model. I could tell she wasn't supermodel material, though. I think it's a really difficult career if you're just not genetically 5 foot 10, size 0, with amazing bone structure. I mean, she was certainly a lovely, cute young woman, but you know, she wasn't that. So, how did you like modeling? I asked her. Well, some of the customers apparently thought they could fondle the models. Surprise, surprise. I got the impression that the girls who modeled also had to work as salespeople. Plus, it only paid minimum wage, and sometimes she said she didn't get paid at all. I don't know. I feel like if you're going to stand in a window wearing lingerie, you should make more than minimum wage. But what do I know? I'm not running a lingerie business. So I asked her if she had thought about maybe working as a server, because servers can make a lot of money, and that would give her some money while she figured out what she really wanted to do. Maybe she assumed the boyfriend would support her, but they were living in the basement of this dingy little bike shop, or at least they were sleeping there. There was no heat, no kitchen, just that wood stove. You like this better than living with your parents, I asked her. Yes. She didn't get into why, and it's certainly possible that it was an untenable, abusive situation. I don't know. I still think about her when I walk past that bicycle shop, and I do hope she made it out of that shitty relationship and situation okay. And some of these guys did end up helping Abe out with some of the work. He paid them, so it wasn't charity. He also provided refreshments during the day. Sometimes he bought them dinner or lunch. The girl's boyfriend was one of the guys who offered to work. But every time Abe asked him, he just couldn't. Ah, my head, he'd say to Abe. I'm just not into it. I, I don't understand people who can't bring themselves to work. Abe suspects he had a substance abuse problem, but I can't imagine that working would be worse than living in that dingy basement of that bicycle shop. Not even a proper home. But some of those guys did show up, albeit not reliably. On one particularly hot day, there were a few guys helping him with some of the heavier work. And when they took a break, Abe offered them water. One of the guys, older with a distended, hard abdomen that resembled someone in maybe their third trimester with twins, said, Nah, I've already had enough water. Abe could clearly see that he had had no water, and it was hot enough that he was genuinely worried about them getting heat stroke, so he offered them beer. They all accepted the beer quite happily. The first time I met the main guy, Derek, He told me he was going to teach Abe how to run a project. Uh Uh-huh. I didn't say anything to him, but my number one tip by then would have been 
don't count on the neighborhood guys like Derek to run your project. Derek had become a little too comfortable with Abe. He started to act as though he was the general contractor or the homeowner, and Abe was his bitch. He started out okay, I think, but as time went on, he, more and more often, he didn't show up when he said he would. One time, Abe advanced him a few days' pay, and I'm pretty sure he never showed up to work again. That was the night before the cement pour was due, and Derek had committed to helping Abe prep. When I got home from my class at about 10 p.m., Abe was still in the basement working on the gravel, rebar, insulation, PEX tubing for the in-floor heat. I ended up having to help, which isn't great because I really just, I'm not, I don't have great physical upper body strength. Like me trying to shovel gravel and, and, and do that kind of work, it's not efficient. Plus, Abe was periodically running the saw through the night. I was worried about noise violations. And at some point in the morning, I just couldn't do any more. I wasn't even being, I wasn't even useful at some point in the morning, so I just left him to it. He was barely ready when his brothers and the cement truck arrived. I think it was 8 or 8.30 in the morning. Derek had really let him down this time. And we still see him hanging around the neighborhood, sometimes doing odd jobs for some of the local businesses. I don't know if he's a couch surfer or homeless, but it's amazing what the human body can take and still wake up every day. He ended up frustrating Abe so much that Abe absolutely cannot stand the sight of him. He calls him the village idiot. He approached me a few times after he knew we had moved into the house in 2009, and he said, Hey, when's Abe having the party? Abe promised us he'd have a party when the house was done. And I just said, Oh, sorry, Derek, the house isn't done yet, and I don't know when it'll be done. And you know what? I never heard about a party. Maybe Abe changed his mind. Abe definitely did not want them coming inside and scoping the place out once he got to know them a little better. And once we realized that the neighborhood guys really weren't that interested in helping with the work, I arranged for short-term labor through an agency called Ready Labor, which provides temporary unskilled laborers. They had insurance, they provided safety equipment, and charged the labor to the credit card that we gave them for their files. All you had to do was let them know what type of help you needed, and they sent whoever was available on the day. Abe didn't actually end up using them too much. There were a couple of guys who were great when they actually showed up, but again, it was so hard to rely on anyone showing up. One of his colleagues at uh, the IT job said all he'd have to do was go to Home Depot and guys who want work for the day are just hanging around. And I'm like, really? Maybe in warm climates. I've seen that on TV and movies, but it's definitely not the case here. But the renovation was instrumental in Abe getting to know all the characters of the neighborhood. Whenever I'd go to the butcher around the corner, they'd ask, how's that renovation going? Very small town. There were two Greek social clubs around the corner, one on the north side and one on the south side of the street. They had garish, fluorescent lighting with a hodgepodge of old kitchen chairs. Only the older men frequented those clubs, some might say elderly, because yes, often they walked slowly, stooped over. So I think elderly is perfectly appropriate in this context. But it was mostly old guys hanging in and around the clubs. It didn't attract the young men at all, so it's no surprise that they're no longer there. I used to call those places my fan clubs. On a nice day, they would be outside smoking, drinking, and chatting, but they'd all stop as I approached and silently watch me pass. Old men like me, believe it or not, even though they've said I was feisty. Strangely enough, it didn't feel creepy at all to be watched by them. I don't know why. Maybe partly it was because I grew up in an era when we expected that from men. And I would say all of them were definitely that generation and older. Plus, they were our neighbors, most of whom Abe had gotten to know. 
the renovation onlookers, the sometimes helpers. One man in particular was always eager to help and give advice, very long-winded advice, I might add. I would say he's possibly near 90 now, but he's fit, energetic, and he's a chatty gentleman. He was often at the fan club, but he was never one of the ones who stared. Our neighborhood vibe really is so small town. Of course, many of the businesses have changed since we bought the house, just from time and certainly during COVID, but there are some old standbys remaining. The corner store, or as my children would have called it, the treat store. The restaurant bar next to it called Menelon. We've always pronounced it Menelon. Don't know why, we just do. They have an outdoor patio at the rear, and let me tell you that patio has been bumping since the university students have returned. It backs onto the laneway a couple of houses down from us, and we can hear it all the time. Sometimes they even have bands there. I can't imagine how it is for the guy who lives right next to it, but we marvel at the energy the patrons have for boozing and fun. I guess the students haven't dropped out yet, I said to Abe one night, but we suspect the men allons patrons are not studying very hard. It could get a lot quieter by spring. There's a part of me that's strangely drawn to the sounds of all that revelry, but then I remind myself that it wouldn't be as much fun for me as it seems. Maybe I'm elderly after all. We've only been to the Menelon patio once, pre-lockdown, on a pub crawl with Abe's sister Mary and her husband Carl. It was nothing fancy, a hell of a lot better than that bike shop, but they did have nice lighting and kind of a... I don't know, a nice vibe. It used to be owned by one of the younger, but not young, fan club members who had a jet black comb over that didn't match the deep lines in his face at all. We always wondered when we saw him whether he just dyed his hair or was wearing a very bad toupee. Now that I think of it, I guess since it was a comb over, it had to have been his own hair. Who buys a comb-over toupee? I don't think anyone would. But one day, he left his van parked on our street with the keys in the door. Eagle Eye Abe, of course, ever watchful of the neighborhood goings-on while he worked outdoors, and even now, from his office bay window, brought the keys to him at the restaurant before someone else could make off with the van. Comb-over was so thankful. He offered Abe a free beer at the Menelon in appreciation. He never did collect on that. But one night, one of the small, older fan club members collapsed across the street from us. From Abe's office, he heard him call out as he fell, so he dashed outside to make sure he was okay. I've had a lot of beer, he said to Abe. He could not get up. And Abe didn't want to get him up and just help him home. He knew he lived alone, and he was worried. What if he had fractured his neck? Abe would never forgive himself if that man died at home alone through the night, so he figured he'd better call emergency services so they could assess his condition before moving him. Abe laid down on the sidewalk beside him, which I think was extraordinarily kind, and waited about 20 minutes for the paramedics to arrive. He saw them as they were about to drive past and waved them down. We didn't see you there. Good thing you waved us down. Yeah, yeah, it is a good thing. You would think the paramedics would assess this man's condition. They did not. They got him up, helped him up the steps and into his house, and left. Okay, he could have done that. Abe was relieved to see him heading to the fan club a few days later. One icy night in Sarnia, Abe witnessed a truck about a kilometer ahead of him swerve back and forth, then spin 180 degrees so the headlights were pointed toward him, then tip into a ditch which was about two meters deep, and then land on the roof. He pulled over and sprung into action. The water was about a meter deep and ice cold. Of course, there was ice on the road. He jumped into the ditch on the passenger side where there was more clearance from the bank. And he couldn't open the door because the top was submerged in mud, so the door didn't budge. 
Another guy arrived on the scene seconds later, called 911, and between the two of them, they managed to get the door open, which was severely bent. A woman and two men were able to crawl out. They must have hit a patch of black ice. If you've never driven in conditions with black ice, you don't even see it. They obviously hit a patch of it. The Sarnia police recognized Abe and the other guy with a Heroes Award at a ceremony later that year. Then there was the night that Abe, working late in his home office, which had a bird's eye view of the street, heard a young woman yelling something and looked out to see her stumbling onto the street. A car had to swerve to avoid hitting her. Of course, he ran out to help her. I happened to also be working late that night, but I was at the client's site. I wasn't at home. Abe and I were both working on our respective clients' go-live weekends, which meant all hands on deck, 24 hours a day until the new system was ready for business. And of course, we realize that drunk young women are particularly vulnerable. And I would hope that if someone I cared about was in that position, a decent human being would help her out. So he went out to make sure she was safe. After all, she was so hammered, she was falling into the street. So even if no one deliberately hurt her, a driver could have hit her. You'd never forgive yourself if you hit someone, even if it wasn't your fault. And at the time, there had also been news reports of um, there had been some discoveries of human remains, not in our neighborhood specifically, but in the GTA. So, of course, he wasn't going to just ignore that. When he approached her, she initially kind of gave him a dirty look, and she was looking at him with mistrust. And he thought, well, okay, maybe she's not that drunk. She knows enough to be look at me skeptically. So he started walking away and said, I hope you get home safely. Then she called out to him, wait, maybe I do need help. So he hailed a taxi and waited to make sure she got in and home safely. He asked her for her address so the taxi driver could take her home, and she vaguely said she didn't know her address, which seemed strange. But Abe figured maybe she had just recently moved there, and she just was so drunk she didn't know it off the top of her head. She dug into her purse, and Abe could see that the purse contained basically a dead phone, some coin, and a key ring with about 20 keys. She pointed toward a one-way street and directed the taxi driver to go down the wrong way. The taxi driver said, look, you can just walk then if it's that close. Abe gave him some money for his trouble, and they got out and started walking together because Abe wasn't going to just leave her there. He wanted to make sure she was safe. How far is it, he said, within walking distance? Yeah, 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 just up here. Then she started ranting about, I don't know, about something that had been bothering her. Then she lamented about her divorce. So she was old enough to have been married and divorced. Abe figured maybe, maybe late 20s. How much further, he asked, because they kept walking and walking. Not far. Do you want to fuck? I guess she liked him. Uh, no, I'm happily married, thanks. Now, this is him telling me the story. Then she continued on with her rant. And then she offered again, but with the assurance, don't worry, no one will find out. By this time, Abe wasn't sure they were getting close to her home. So he said, okay, let's do it. But we can't do it at my place because my wife might come home. Well, Wouldn't you know, she suddenly remembered her address. They hailed another taxi, and off they went. And it wasn't really that close. I mean, it was within walking distance for an urban dweller, but probably an hour's walk. It was one of Catherine's old neighborhoods when she first lived in Toronto. Abe paid for the taxi, helped her to her apartment, and miraculously, she was able to pick out the key amongst the bunch of keys to her apartment, though her fine motor skills were such that Abe said he did have to unlock the door for her. As soon as she was in, Abe said, I gotta go. 
Oh, no, no, come on, come in, something like that. And Abe said, sorry, I got to go. And with that, he left and called me at work when he got home. It was maybe about 3.30 in the morning, and I remember getting the call. I was in a conference room at a table, a conference room table, surrounded by several of my colleagues. When I finished the call, I hung up and told them about Abe's new girlfriend, and we all laughed and laughed. And, you know, I referred to her as uh, his girlfriend for a while after that. Who really knows for sure? Maybe he did actually go into her apartment and bang her. I mean, he could have, and I would have no way of knowing. But I honestly do trust him, and I believe the story. But we also did discuss the risk to him. I know he meant well, but he was alone with her on the street in a taxi, well, not really alone in the taxi, in the apartment building. He could have been in big trouble if he accidentally hurt her, if she suddenly got violent. What if she accused him of sexual assault? I know it's true that she wouldn't have been able to provide evidence or a rape kit, as they call it, to prove any allegation. And we all know most sexual assault allegations aren't taken seriously. But... It could have been an ugly period of time for him if he had to defend himself. And I'm all for helping people, but I think it's a good idea to try and have a witness around, if at all possible. At least there was the taxi driver. Who knows if he would have been a reliable witness. Did he notice how handsy this woman was on the ride home? (laughs) Yeah, if somebody got handsy with me, I would be done with helping them. I am... A a small woman is more physically vulnerable than the other way around. But I loved that story about his girlfriend. And there are other situations I can't remember where he's run outside and helped people with things. And a few years ago, Joanne's ex, before he was her ex, and his fellow band members were staying with us while they had gigs in Toronto. And one night, for some reason, the topic of Abe's rescues came up. I don't remember how, but Devin, the band's leader, said, Wow, Abe, you're the Batman of Ossington. We laughed and laughed. I love that. He is the Batman of Ossington. Rescuer of all, young and old, lending a helping hand in our small town in the big city. A true hero. Thank you for listening. If you have anything you'd like to share... You can email me at jewelsays at gmail.com. Have a wonderful week. 